Tread. Long. Long. Work first of our series of webinars introducing you to the concept of fusion learning. Sharon Young, um, Director and Consultant at Pearl Catches. We have the idea behind fusion learning. is to help organizations move from training to learning. Seven deadly forms of training that we have identified in our research that are still committed by thousands of organizations across the world. This is seven pearls of wisdom that um, transform the real organization into learning. On this, we're going to be exploring the first sin and the pearl of wisdom. A rough of some internet now, let me introduce you to the purpose of the webinar. Talk first, deadly sin. Look at learning interventions in your organization. Pearl of wisdom. And have an opportunity for questions and answers. At the end of the session, I will bring you questions throughout because I want to make this as interactive as possible. Please do use the chat buttons that you've actually got on the meeting system here to give me responses to the various questions that we're going through. So what I want to do today is to take you through the process that we have for setting a clear outcome for an organization, for the self and for the individual learners. In terms of at the end of this half an hour, I'd like to be able to explain the deadly sin number one, identify when you've seen this method within organizations. I'd like you to take the first of our pearls of wisdom and to be in the different steps that you need to take, set good objectives and outcomes for your learning interventions. And to be able to to incorporate that into your organization. So this deadly sin. Outputs and not outcomes. So often in organizations, not on what you actually want to get at the end of it, but it's right about just here ticking boxes. So, question I'd like you now to enter into your text boxes. What's your experience of when seeing this happen in organizations? So, when have you come across organizations that have got that? Because it's to focus on, on just in the boxes, on just the outputs, not on what you actually really want to achieve, what the end result is. You can take a look at those down, that would be really helpful. So um, we've got here compliance training. Yes, that's a great one for this one. There's any kind of things like health and safety, things that people have gone through, like data protection, for example. Uh, there's an awful lot about just making sure that someone has gone on it, whether that's face to face or on in learning, rather than they've learned anything. Um, so Sue for that one. Um, Sue as well, a knee-jerk reaction to a problem. I've seen that loads of times. There's something gone wrong in the organization. They're training at it to try and fix that problem. And then we're why that doesn't really work very well. Um, to get stuff that people think is relevant. Yeah, something, oh, we need to make sure everyone's covered this. So we'll put that there. And as well here, um, implementing a nationally agreed program. So it's something that we think is important and we need to make sure everyone goes through it and there's no to cater that to the bars of the organization or the individual. So thank you for that comment as well. So interesting but quite sad, I suppose, to see how many of you have experienced some of the same challenges that I have. A bit more detail on the next slide about what some of those things look like. Me around this thing is it's about ticking boxes, not saying, first of all, I have to have someone attended, or secondly, what, whether something's been covered. Now, the end of the I was reading an interesting article recently when they were talking about um, the early days of, of e-learning modules, and a lot of them used to literally, you turned it on and run, um, and went through to the end of it, even if you went off and did something else, the actual board of you as having actually attended and, and, and gone through that piece of learning, um, that is a pure tick box because they wouldn't have learned anything if they weren't actually there. Second thing is about, yes, what has been covered? So what amount of information that we've covered? Here okay, is around things that aren't relevant to the business. And only 
the business for so quite often people say, Oh, we need to have problems resolving training, we need to training. But the idea about what does that actually mean? What does the business need? What what training interacts to that? But then there's no real learning needs analysis. Sometimes called training needs analysis or just needs analysis. I haven't really gone to any trouble of, of, of figuring out what, what people need with the organisation as individuals as well as the organisation. So bringing those together, there's no link then between what are the organisational goals, what are the course, and what are the goals of the individual learners. For me, that is becoming increasingly from these days is do a lot of research around how emotions and how we feel about things impact well we learn or not. And even if you do have objectives for course, something I haven't seen very often is people taking information of what about the learners' emotions, fears, or expectations. If you really want people to get something out of learning, you need to think about them as individuals from that perspective. The thing is, if there is needs analysis, that's not linked to the end evaluation. And you might have a needs analysis up front, but you don't do evaluation well enough to check whether anyone actually achieved the objectives that you set at the outset. Sort of some of the things that I've thought about. Um, what I'd like you to think about now and to give me some responses on is what impact of all this? So if all the things are going on or not being done in organisations, what's the potential impact of those on the learners and the department and ultimately the organisation. If you can take a minute to jot down your ideas, that would be absolutely great. Okay, so from earlier here, uh, people don't actually bring anything back into the workplace. Yep, so basically it's a waste of time. They go on a course, they come back and they don't do anything differently. Um, so, um, yeah, again, I think most of the material isn't used and ultimately that can bring the learning process into to this report. Um complained if there aren't any tangible results. I uh, here about um, about blaming back to the training department again and it really does feel like that sometimes, doesn't it? Um train and get results or does it make any difference to the business overall? Absolutely Christina again. So yet yeah, engagement from the participants that engage with it and you know what that's done they coming uh, so people go don't go to learning and then negative impact on everyone. Yeah, Chris, you put here, that leads to a lack of credibility for training. So we know a lot and we can see the debt it has both on the learners and the department itself and actually ultimately the organisation. So what do we need to improve that? Well, let's start with people plan. An image of the staff. Mason, the cathedral, or at least his great bricks are going to go into the cathedral. So where he's going to get to from the end point of this. I'll ask you now is what are you? So when you are planning a learning intervention, what does it you think about at the outset? So Mason here is thinking about what his cathedral is like. What are some of the things that you think about? Some of the things that you do when you're starting to plan? A intervention. Again, if you notice that would be great. So here, yeah. um, what is the course for? Why are we it? What's and okay, into we know it's been successful. Some evaluation pieces again there. So Sue talking to stakeholders, absolutely. Um and Christina's picked up on that point as well and had a hard conversation with the stakeholders. Um so, so what do they, what do the stakeholders want the learners ultimately to be able to do or be? And it's quite hard to have those conversations sometimes, isn't it, to get people to really understand what they really need. So to look beneath the surface rather than just, oh, I want problem solving training. Okay. And what want that? And what do you expect people to be doing differently? What do you expect to be different at the end? So it can be really challenging for development professionals to be able to have those conversations. So, this, we, we sort of took the word named Stephen, because many of you will have heard of who wrote the very first book of the seven habits of, of highly effective people. His, his key habit that he said was to start with the end in mind. He felt that was so good, um, why should we reinvent the wheel? And so that's 
first turn of wisdom. Start end in mind, very much like the start. It's all about actually understanding what do we to achieve. Before we start, what do we to achieve? And we took further by coming with several different things we need to think about in terms of what we need to achieve. Within that, then, is what are the overall business needs? What in your business that needs something to change? Um, outcomes from that that sit underneath that. So enable you to achieve your overall business needs. What are the outcomes you need? So it's what do people need to learn? And ultimately, when you should result in a change of behaviour, what do people to do as a result of it? Kind of on the top right hand side, we have learner objectives. So for me, these are kind of the, the three key things to think about to start with is what the business, what that means in terms of learning objectives, but then learners as in individuals, that people don't retain information, is they weren't engaged in the first place. They what's in it for me. So those national programs that Gary talked about earlier on that everybody has to go on, when people are pushed into attending things, they don't benefit it. It's so important to engage with those learners and get them to think about what objectives do they want, what do they want to achieve something, and help them to find that motivation, that what's in it for me, that will enable them to get into the right mindset, first of all, to learn, commitment, to go trying out those skills until they them. Very close to coming down to the bottom right hand side is the layers and expectations. And this emotional objectives to me link very, very closely. Something that I think is very, very rarely considered. So not only what you do we think about what the learners want to achieve, what feeling and expectations might they be coming into training for you. Expecting you to cover things that really aren't with what you're going to be doing. You've got concerns about about how they interact with other people, and they're going to have to do one of those horrible role plays. Or one of these courses, they all seem to know a lot more than me. I'm going to feel really, really changed. I'm going to embarrass myself. Out those kind of fears, they're going to be using what we call their reptilian brain, which is to have that fight or flight response. And when someone is in that state, a productive state of learning, so you need to you consider what fears you might have. Opening sessions attempt to allay those fears. But also, it's another reason why you need to have those, those objectives up front. And I take time in a training course for people for their objectives. Because you can let them, you are likely to cover what they're talking about or not. It's better that someone knows at the outset, they get to the end of the session and not met their objectives and their expectations. And they spent the whole day expecting it. The fight then is your additional objectives. When you're planning the environment as a trainer or facilitator, think about where people are going to sit and what slide they're going to have and are you going to have new fiddle toys on the desk and all those kind of things. Often think about the emotional environment. There's amounts of research now around neuroscience that show how closely our emotions are linked to where we learn. And the future papers, purple papers that will be coming out in December will actually give you a lot more information about that stage. Better think about what are the emotional states you need people to be to do what you're going to do on the program. So if you want people to be able to try things out, you need to be feeling safe. If you feel to be joining in with things, you want them to be motivated. People to ask questions, you want them to be feeling curious. So how do you do these and create those kind of emotional states? And so the sort of the different five different aspects that we look at considering when we are talking about objectives. Now, we've linked to a model that some of you may well be quite familiar with. Um, the Kirkpatrick Four Levels of Innovation is a model that's been used for a number of years now to measure things from the different perspectives. So I just want to check in with you and um, on your chat if you think you know how many heard of of the Kirkpatrick model, how many have used it, and if, let's see how many of you can 
remember what the four levels are. So we've got some people. Um, Gary, yep, he has used it, uh, but mostly only at levels one and two. Um, so you've seen that very much in terms of, of happy sheets. That's how we've seen that used. Okay. Um, Elise as well, yep, she understands the basic levels of one and two. Um, so seen again. Um, positional level at three and four, but not seeing much of that. Um, time they get to three and four, people seem to be very busy doing something, absolutely. And, um, so, Christina has got all four. So, level one is the reaction. So, how did the learners react to the training? Did they enjoy it? Did they find it useful? Level two is knowledge. So, did they gain the knowledge that they needed to move forward? Um, level three is performance. So, did they do anything differently um, in terms? The way they performed when they were back in the workplace, and for what's the difference for business? Great, a great model. But one recently is um, originally created by Don Click back in the 1950s. And though it's still used today, Don Sun has actually completely rejigged this um, in what he now calls the New World Kirkpatrick model. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but I'd like to introduce you to it because I think it's absolutely great. It's only the system of evaluation. But it can be used in plan as well to help you set the objectives very much as we've described here. I'd like to talk you through that briefly and then see if I can get your feedback and see whether you've been that used at all. So it's still, as you will be, they look at it in a slightly different way. And when we're planning, um, I recommend as you actually start with level four. We said when we talked about the business needs, so the outcome of the business. Um, how are your leading indicators that show you whether you're on the right road to be achieving your outcome for the business? That's if we said the business needs. Coming backwards, is what are the behaviours that we need to be adopting to the business to meet the outcomes? So in the model here, which I'm not going to go into detail, which back time we made that one, um, but it's about what are the behaviours, what do people need to be doing on the job? Make that happen. You may, no may notice there's a monitor and adjust at the top, and that's very much in terms of if we're not getting the results, then we need to go back and adjust what we're doing at the behavioral level and move backwards and forwards. Level four is our business objectives. objectives. Level three are sort of learning outcomes and the actual behaviors we need people to have. Two, this is the link of what was called the knowledge before, but they've added a couple of extra things to this. So we still have what is the knowledge that we need people to have a basis, but your skills to go with that for people to do something with the knowledge and the right attitude to think they, that they do that. We've all talked about, for example, with customer service training. If someone's being the skills to the customer as a bit of a pain and not something that they need to sort of think about positively, they're, they're probably still not going to give the best service in the world. The two being added in the new model are confidence and commitment. How to make sure that people are confident enough to be able to try out those skills and use the behaviors back in the workplace. So just giving people loads and loads of information and know to practice that, they're not going to be confident. It makes you think about how you structure your learning interventions to include time in that for practice. And there's commitment. So then the learner objectives. If you can see what's in it for me, they can understand the benefits of them to make their job easier, then they are likely to be committed to do something back in the workplace. From level, in terms of what they need to know, they need to be able to do, what they need to think, how they need to feel, is the, which is the reaction. And then I'm back to, okay, so how do we engage? And these are all the things we talked about um, when we're talking about the learning in terms of the emotional objective, in terms of fears and expectations. How do we engage? from the outset, that we help them see this is relevant and we get their way feeling satisfied that they have had something dealt with. A very short version through the model. There's loads of information on their website and I would recommend that you have a look at that. Uh, I would also recommend that you have a look at, at our verbal papers that are going to be published on November. There's going to be local papers that we're going to be publishing over the next few months. The ones on the 1st of November is creating um, improving the value of l and in your organisation and relates very much to, to both the needs analysis and evaluation and it explores this model in a lot 
more detail. Interested in this model, I would recommend that you sign up for that purple paper um, and you'll get a lot more information from there. So now from you, um, how have you come across this version of the model and if you try to do that? So again, if you can drop your comments down in the chat box, that would be absolutely brilliant. Uh, Sue's saying she hasn't seen it, but absolutely loves it. Um, I do too, Sue. Um, GAN seems much more practical than the other level. Yeah, you can really see how it works at both levels. I think for me, that's what I love. It's not just about what you do after the event, it's what you do for and during the event as well. I haven't used it yet, but it seems to make sense to, to define your results beforehand, which is absolutely the point of start with the end in mind. Um, okay, Christina, um, she has used it quite recently with a client, and she said that doing it that way um, led her to ask a lot of questions to the client, and the result of that was I said, you know, we need to have a proper needs analysis on this. Uh, so she actually managed to get them from, from using that tool and have proper needs analysis that meant you then end up getting the agent that's, that's going to work. So that's really, really great, great news. So that is a very brief introduction into our first deadly in system and that we've seen in so many organizations focus on output so boxes making sure that people have gone through something that has the same stuff and people have actually learned anything and what we're going to replace that is wisdom which is to start with the end in mind Thing. Let's think of what we want to achieve and be frank to the detail of what we want each course to achieve. You need to know that you are clear on what are the needs of the business, what's the priorities for the business, and then map from that into your behaviours, that learning outcomes for the session, and then link to the individual outcomes and objectives so that you can get that engagement and the emotional objectives and the and expectations and those things then chance your objectives being very very successful what is this is that it probably involves a very different type of work for some of our our LN professionals so rather than just being providers of training so you go I've got a model I'm going to do it's actually much more about trying to facilitate learning in the organisation and involve a whole new set of skills for learning facilitators, but in terms of their influence, working and how they get out in the organisation, and those those difficult questions and have those hard conversations that Christina mentioned earlier on, we're sometimes quite senior people are really going to transform training and learning in your organisation. That's an important thing to do. So one area that we're working on at the moment is helping to a core of key skills for learning facilitators in the 21st century. And one that's going to be published in December is going to go into an awful lot more detail around that and how we can support you as facilitators to really be successful in this new world. I just want to check now if anyone has any final questions. Uh, again, if you can drop those down into your uh, chat box. And while you're doing it, I'd just like to ask you if you could leave some feedback on the webinar um, on RTV, the hashtag Fusion Learning. Um, so we're trying to sort of get some feedback from people and see what we think and what's not working for people. Please do leave some feedback, it would be very much appreciated. So in terms of comments from people, um, so, so oh, people saying it's, it's clear, really love the idea of Fusion Learning, really love the idea of the, the, uh, of the details and things. Um, good question, Christina, here actually. Um, how many people are actually doing this approach, do I think? That's a challenging one, actually. Um, you would think a lot more people, um, because a lot of these things when you come to common sense, but as we know, common sense isn't all that common, and we got caught up in, in, in other things and other priorities. I think a lot of people, when we talk to them about it, are probably the mistakes they're making, or they've seen other people making. But like a lot of people, People are struggling to figure out how do we get right. What do we think? There are some organisations that are doing some of these things really well. 
There are a few organizations involved in, in all of them quite well. A lot of people that are somewhere in the middle between any or they're doing you. And what we're trying to achieve with Fusion Learning is to help them adapt for you. Some of the services we're going to be providing is to organizations and, and, and help you to assess which of the areas that you're strong in that you want to sort of continue with and what are the areas that maybe you need to make some improvements. And hopefully we can help you into that so that we can turn training into learning and would have much more effective learning interventions as individuals and as organizations. I'd just like to draw your attention this afternoon. Our webinar will be on next Friday, the 1st of November, and we'll be looking at this one in the second edition and second part of this system. The second is around the fact that some people think that learning and sheep to train are the same thing, which we don't. The pearl of wisdom is that learning is actually a process and not an event. So next week, look forward to speaking to some of you again then. Otherwise, thank you very much for your attention. Goodbye.